greet you in the name of the Triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today I come to you and I want to share a secret with you. I want to share to you, with you today the secret to having a long and health filled life. Do you believe that I have to understand? Uh, Y'all not, not with me this morning. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the secret to living a long and healthy life. Would you like to know what it is? Yes. yes. The scripture that tells us that Jesus came to teach us the path to eternal life. But also, Jesus wants us to have a life of abundance. Jesus wants us to live life more abundantly. Now, when you look at health and longevity, the research I've seen says that only about 10% of it is genetic. Only about 10% of your health and longevity you got from your mother and father. The other 90% has to do with your behavior, your decisions, and your environment. Let me, let me just pause for a minute. Let me ask you a question. Now, we got people in this room who know the Bible very well. They say that the promised land was only a six-day journey from Egypt. But how long did it take for them to get there? 40 years. 40 years. Forty years. It took them six days. It would take them six days, but it took them forty years. Why do you think it took them that much long? Any ideas? This is just your idea. This is not. <coughs> You're reading the Bible. Say it again. They had some lessons, had some lessons to learn. They didn't follow Jesus. They didn't follow the word. That's right. Anybody on this side of the room? You know, I think that you can be delivered because they were delivered from their oppression, but they still had to be healed. I think there's people in this room who knows what it feels like to be delivered, to be delivered from that time of trial, to be delivered from pain, to be delivered from fear. But once you're delivered, you still got some healing. To the group of people who have been enslaved for generations, they have some healing to do. They have some healing in their hearts. And they had to renew their minds. I think that's what it took them 40 years. So when we come to church, we come here not just to praise God, we come here to be healed. We come here to be transformed. We come here to be made anew. Now what I'm about to tell you is the cutting edge of longevity science. We're reading some work by a man named Dan Buechner. B-U-E-T-T-N-E-R. Dan Buechner. We know that only 10% of longevity and health has to do with what your mother and father gave you. But there are environmental factors also. If you're in an environment where there's a lot of alcohol consumption, <clears throat> that's going to mess up your health. Mm -hmm. And we know all of this stuff is contagious. If you're in a place with a lot of obesity, that's going to mess up your health because that stuff is all contagious. If you live in a place with pollution, it's going to hurt your health. But you know what's bigger than all of that? Bigger than obesity, bigger than alcohol consumption, bigger than pollution. Loneliness. Hmm. You, can go, you can go get the book, it's called Blue Zones. He looked all around the world for these communities where there was a gigantic cohort of folks making it to their 80s and to their 90s and they were centenarians. 
And one thing they realized, one thing that they had in common, is that as people aged, they had stuff to do. They had a cohort, they had friends, they had purpose in their lives. What's the number one time in a person's life for them to die? Any guesses? I just mumbled in the back, what you say? New Year's. New Year's? 20 school, 20 school. The number one time in a person's life for them to die is when they retire. That's what the research says. And I can see that. I've heard stories about folks who just died right after they retired. Maybe they had too much of a good thing all of a sudden. Like, I don't have to go to work. I'm just going to let that all hang out. I don't know. Or maybe they lost that sense of purpose. You know, some folks go to work and sit around and argue and pick fights and, and have coups against each other. But at least they have something to do. But if you don't have anything to do, that sense of loneliness and that sense of isolation can be overwhelming. But a lot of times, again, we just diagnose. Sometimes we want to medicate ourselves not with friendships and camaraderie and community, because then you gotta like compromise with people, right? You gotta listen to people. You can't just have it your way. We human beings are communal folk. We need rituals. We need to meet up periodically. We need to share our stories. We need to hug each other. I bet you right now. that you can look at somebody that you maybe worked with, maybe somebody you went to high school with, maybe a family member, and that person right now is at home by himself. That person is at home by herself. And maybe sometime in the next week or so, you might get a phone call. And underneath that phone call is that deep feeling of isolation, that deep feeling of purposelessness, I don't have a purpose for my life. You know, my kids don't call me anymore. My spouse, maybe my spouse has passed. Maybe my spouse is with me, but she doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> he don't talk to me anymore. I just feel so isolated. I feel so, so alone in the world. It is that lack of purpose that kills us. Literally. Kills us. That person you went to high school with, that person you used to work with, that cousin of yours, that sibling of yours, needs to be here in this room with us. <coughs> needs to be a part of this community. That person needs to be embraced by us. I read from you the 19th chapter of Luke. Let's go to the end of the 18th chapter. At the end of the 18th chapter of Luke, we find Jesus, who, and he is on his way to Jericho. He's going through Jericho to get to Jerusalem, but at the 18th chapter, he's on his way into Jericho. And on his way to Jericho, he is met by a man who is blind. And the man who is blind asserted himself. The man who was blind pushed his way through the crowd. Let me tell you this. If you don't remember anything else about what this sermon is about, let it be known, my brothers and sisters, that you have got to go and get what you want in life. You can't stand by and be like, oh, ain't nobody calling me, I'm having you. You have to go and get what you want in life. You have to push your way through. God has given us a whole lot of power. God has given us the ability to reject God. And God still loves us. God has given us the ability to be a fool. And God is still welcome us back. But God has given you the power of self-determination. God has given you the power of faith. 
And that's the most powerful thing of all. I'm looking at this chapter 18 of Luke and I see the blind man. I can just see him. Could you imagine being in Cyprus? It's like being in a dark room and you not knowing what's going on. You know, you're, you're vulnerable and you're weak and you're, you're outside. You're outside because you can't see because you're blind. But this blind man in the 18th chapter of Luke had hope, had faith. They told him Jesus was coming by and he pushed his way through the crowd. And Jesus said, what do you want? He said, son of David, have mercy on me. Please restore my sight. How much faith How much self-determination, how much power does it take for a person in a situation like that to assert, to assert himself? <laughs> oh, you've all done it already. You all have done it already. Everyone in this room knows what it feels like to be in the dark. Everyone in this room knows what it feels like to be afraid and not know what's coming. Everybody knows what it feels like to get on your knees or to just lay in the bed and say, God, if you can heal me, if you can help me, if you can deliver me, God, please in the name of Jesus. That's what the blind man said. And just like Jesus did you, Jesus looked at that blind man and said, your faith, your faith has healed you. Your sight is restored. Scripture tells us that he went all around Jericho. And Jericho is probably one of the small towns where everybody knows everybody. And he told everybody, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, the son of David, has restored my sight. They're like, isn't that the guy who used to be blind? Isn't that the man who was sightless, who had to beg, who had to be led around by his family all the time? He is one of us. He has a sight back. As I read the 19th chapter of Luke, and I opened the book to see about the man named Zacchaeus. I think Zacchaeus, I think Zacchaeus must have heard about this blind man. I think Zacchaeus must have, may have known this blind man. Because Zacchaeus had hope. Now, in scripture, this is a very interesting combination of things. Zacchaeus, they tell us he was a short man, right? And he was a rich man, right? Yes. Now this is where I don't understand. I'm trying to figure out how this works in modern times. Well, he was ostracized. He was shunned. He was an outsider. You know, I started thinking, and sometimes it doesn't matter how much money in your bank. Sometimes it doesn't matter how big your house is or how nice your car is. Sometimes you can just feel isolated and lonely and alone. Sometimes you can just feel, and you, I, just, I got an image of like this really rich person in this big giant mansion all by himself. He wants somebody to look at his house. He might throw a party. Maybe people, come, maybe people will show up for his party, but when the, when the party's over, he's, he's all alone. He's lonely. He's an outsider. But that wasn't Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a bad guy. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. <coughs> so let me tell you, Karen, imagine if you will, Zacchaeus, somebody coming and invading your land. And then Eddie Neal gets the job. Hey, Eddie, would you like a job? Like yeah, yeah, I get the job. Go and get money from Karen and her mother and everybody in here and bring it back to me. And Eddie says, of course I will. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take so much money, I'm going to keep a little bit for myself. And Karen, if you don't like it, you know what Eddie's going to do? He's going to call them soldiers. He's not there with you. He's going to call them soldiers in and make sure he gets his money. So when you see Eddie, you might be mad at him, but you better, better watch what you say. That was the case. Oh, 
they did not like cicadas. Oh, they did not like cicadas. And I can see cicadas with his big house and his fine clothes and all of the accoutrement being shunned, being hated, being despised. Scripture tells us that Zacchaeus said, I want to see who Jesus is. Zacchaeus fought through the crowd because he wanted to see who Jesus was. There's two different ways that I can take that. On one level, maybe he fought through the crowd so he could take a look at Jesus. So he could just see what Jesus looked like. But then again, maybe he wanted to see who Jesus, what kind of person Jesus was. Was Jesus the kind of person who would forgive him for all the bad things that he has done? You know, I know what it feels like to climb a sycamore tree and hopes of forgiveness. I know it wasn't a sycamore tree it was sitting behind my, 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 my car steering wheel and just sitting there praying to God and asking for forgiveness, asking to be delivered, asking to be healed. And God has not failed me yet. They say when Jesus walked through Jericho, he looked up at the sycamore tree and he saw Zacchaeus. And he looked at Zacchaeus with love. He looked at Zacchaeus and he loved Zacchaeus. Hey, Zacchaeus, I see you in the sycamore tree. Come on down here. I need to stay with you. I need to hang out with you. I need to take you from the outside, Zacchaeus. I need to remove you from all that pain and all that loneliness, Zacchaeus, and bring you into my fold. You see, brothers and sisters, one thing that I learned you have been here almost five years. Next week will be five years exactly. I came here on All Saints Sunday in 2011. And the one thing I've learned about this parish is that it is a blue zone. It is a zone where we appreciate people of every age. It's a zone where people have purpose and community. Now, we might... We might have a disagreement now, now and again. We might have, you know, we, you know how it is. We get too many people together. There's going to be some personalities that's going to conflict. There's going to be some attitudes. But it's way more love than it is anything else. And in our coming together, and our having a purpose, we are here. I'd like to pray for you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, I pray for all that is in the sound of my voice. I see them all sitting in the sycamore trees in their lives. I see them reaching out to you. And I see Jesus reaching back and hugging them and holding them. I feel them and I see them healed from all of their problems. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.